friends, this is Trish and welcome to Teacher Therapy. Today we have a very special guest named Chris and he has been in education for 27 years. He was a school teacher from 1995 all the way to 2022 and he's just going to have so many stories for us. He is going to help us understand what has happened in education for these past few decades. So Chris, I would love for you to tell us what was your teacher education program like? Did you feel like it really prepared you for the reality? of teaching? <laughs> no. Even back then, I mean, I'm <clears throat> my career extends back to what some of my colleagues refer to as the glory days of education before a lot of the modern nonsense started. And um, no, I can't really claim that uh, my teacher prep classes did really any good. I, I enjoyed some of them. I had a, a, let's see, it was educational psychology class that was on a, in an academic sense was very interesting to me, but my methods classes were, they were pushing at the time. The big thing at the time was manipulatives, hands-on, you know, everything has to be hands-on. Everything has to be manipulatives. Everything has to be project-based. And if you're not doing it this way, then you're bad. My, <laughs> my faculty advisor who shall remain nameless. Um, I, I have a strong personality. My students used to refer to me as savage and not in a, a mean way. I mean, my kids and I got along great, but they could rely on me to just say that, tell the truth in blunt terms. And I did this, uh, this lady and I did not get, get along together. And so I had a actually a slightly unpleasant uh, experience in my methods classes. Now I had a great student teaching experience. I was able to actually work with two teachers, two cooperating teachers, uh, one of whom was a very what you would consider an old fashioned teacher. You know, here's the book, here's section 3.1, tomorrow it's 3.2, day after 3.3 and so on. The other lady um, was really, really inspiring to me. She took the, the hands-on approach, but she, she was unique in that she used investigations. It was a geometry class specifically. And I modeled everything I did from moving forward for every class I ever taught on what she did. Jenny Baum, if you're listening, Jenny, thank you. I think she's still teaching. She would be in her early 70s now, but she was one of those teachers that was just a go-getter. So I had a great student teaching experience, but my my prep classes, no. Mm -mm. I had no idea. You know, the, the first day I can remember setting up my classroom before, uh, you know, all the first day hoopla, you know, all the, all the line dancing and rubbish that districts make you go through. <laughs> we used to call them the rah-rah days, you know, the, the toxic positivity days. <laughs> and uh, I remember setting up my classroom and a teacher who worked there, she had actually been my teacher when I was in grade school. And she walked through and she took a look at everything and she proceeded to destroy how I had set up my room because the students were going to vandalize things. And I, that was a major shock, but I discovered very quickly that she was right. And none of my classes at, at university in university prepped me for that. What are what were the students like? And would you say that students have changed over the past 27 plus years? It was um, it was a shock. I was teaching geometry and also a few sections of algebra. And the there was only one other math teacher at the school at that time. We only had 200 students. We had a ninth grade and a 10th grade. The school had been, only been open one year, so we didn't have anything above a sophomore class. It was interesting because it, it was a little bit of a shock. And, you know, I, I hear stories about the number one reason why teachers at that time would get out of the profession. One of the number, one of the, the big reasons, I don't know if it was number one, is that um, they could, it was difficult for them to handle that students didn't love their subject like they did. It was a big shock and it was a shock to me, but it's not like me to take things lying down. Uh, it was kind of crazy for a while. Um, a lot of it was my fault. You know how it is when you first become a teacher, it takes a few years to get it to get it down. I did a lot of things wrong that first year. I look back and I just think, oh, <laughs> what were you thinking? And, uh, you know, there were, there's a lot of challenging behavior, no matter when, you know, when you're, I mean, I can remember in school, in high school, there were, there were those kids who would be challenges to the teacher behaviorally. Um, but it, there were far fewer. Now I had some, some students who were in algebra one, and I think they'd been in a class before, like in middle school and they'd failed it and they were kind of grumpy and bitter about it. And so they, they wanted to take all that out on me. Uh, when I went away at Christmas break that year in December, I knew I had to totally change everything moving forward. And when I came back in January, students who graduated that, that year later told me like, yeah, you totally changed. You know, you were not Mr. Nice Guy anymore. You were like, here it is. This is what we're doing. We're back in rows. We're not in little groups anymore. I had to do it to survive. Yep. 
And uh, they, they kind of laughed, you know, I, I met some of them. Um, I have, I'm lucky enough to actually be friends uh, through Facebook and other social media platforms with quite a few former students stretching all the way back to the mid nineties. And they told me, and they're like, yeah, boy, you changed. I'm like, I had to, I had to. And I think sometimes some teachers say they can't, they can't change. They, they want to keep moving forward because university tells you, you sh should be doing things this way. And if you don't, you're not good. And that's, that's not true. As Mr. Peterson would say, old school is good school. So I'm kind of curious about discipline philosophies and how you've seen that change. Do you feel like you could discipline a class in the 90s and that change once you got into the 2000s era? Or have you kind of seen, since you've been kind of in the same district, same area, has it been kind of consistent with what you were allowed to do and not do? It did change. Um, and it, it mostly because of admin coming and going. Mm. Now, we were lucky enough, I was lucky enough to be there when uh, one of my colleagues, who's also retired now, uh, she referred to those days as Camelot. We had a, a really good principal and a really good assistant principal and, who they were they would support they had a great balance. They would support teachers and students and everyone. It was a, it was great. It was wonderful. And then we had a shakeup in the mid 2000s. There was sort of a, what I refer to as a coup when I don't know, I don't know what happened exactly. My guess is school board members didn't like this particular principal and conspired to get rid of her. And that was a major shock. Um, now, personally, with regards to discipline back then, yeah, it, looking back on it now, I'm, I'm trying to think of having particularly confrontations with students, which is one is never a good idea. Do not engage is the best thing to do. It was actually fairly consistent. Um, I always believe discipline wise, I need to handle myself in my classroom. And I'm really glad I did that because as we move forward in answering your question, admin became, it was clear that they became less and less willing to deal with discipline unless it was something really severe, you know, fighting or drugs or something like that, which they would still handle. But uh, I know this has come up on your channel before. Sometime around Around then, maybe a few years later, late late 2000s, around 2010, we started uh, implementing PBIS. And a lot of us saw that as a way to kind of shut teachers up because there's a multi-step process you have to go through. And after a while, I, I realized what they, what some of it was, was that they just wanted to reduce paperwork. Mm -hmm. Now you need to handle it more in your time. First, it's a conference, then it's another conference, then it's a detention, then it's this, then it's that. And it was like five or six steps. And I just realized like, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. I'll deal with this on my own. I don't want to get into this bureaucratic um, rubbish. So I, mm -hmm. I'm glad I learned early on to deal with things on my own, unless it's something really bad, really bad. The entire time I was a teacher, there were exactly two fights in my room. One was in 2018, 20, 2019. And the other was the very first year. So I'm lucky that students were, were mostly fine. You know, they, you once in a while get students who were angry with one another, but I could always work with them and diffuse it. But I did notice as, as we moved closer to this time, you know, moving into the future, it seems like they're, they really are, are less, they don't want to deal with it. Because I think their their admin constantly has to put out fires everywhere. Yeah, I'm curious. Have you seen the motivation of students change over the years? Because I feel like I was only in the classroom from 2013 through 2021. But even in that short period of time, I felt like every year it was harder to motivate students to do anything. Did you have that experience too? Yes, and it was for me the the decrease or the decline in motivation. It was insidious. Uh, I did not. I'm sure it was there for a long time, but I really, I really didn't notice it until I was teaching geometry. That was my favorite math subject to teach because you can make, you can make geometry real. You know, you can, there's a lot of, a lot of application for geometry out there, real stuff. And I had a, I had been working on it for so long that I, it was a tight ship. I mean, I, I was having a lot of success. I, we were having a lot of fun and everything was working. And then suddenly it wasn't. And my first instinct, just, just who I am, I immediately want to question myself. Are you doing something wrong? What are you, what are, how have you changed? Are you doing something differently now? And after looking at that problem, considering that question for a while, I realized that there, it wasn't me. Uh, the most notably, this would have been around, probably around 2010, the hands-on approach that I took to uh, geometry with working with geometry. The, and it was, an investigational approach. And I noticed that it had worked so well for so many years. When they're active, it's a little more interesting for them or a lot more interesting for them for some. And they told me later after they graduated, they said, you know, I didn't like your your approach to math at first because you were making me do stuff. <laughs> you were making me do things. But you know what? I still remember it to this day. I remember what we did and I remember 
what the results were. And then that wasn't happening anymore. And it was around 2010 that I became aware that there was something going on. And I could see it was just they there was a even the hands on the investigational approach, it just wasn't working. There was no there wasn't any buy in anymore. And and I thought, okay, this is different. And shortly thereafter, I began teaching a different class that I taught uh, all the way to the end of my career, a finance class. So I don't know what would have happened if I'd have continued on that, uh, that path with geometry. But yes, it became apparent to me around 2010. And what have you seen with technology in the classroom and just the push for iPads and even students bringing their cell phones? Has that shown up as a problem at all for you? Yes. Um, you know, the some of my my colleagues and I there you know, I have I worked with some really truly amazing people I, the district was extremely lucky to have that many good people I don't I still to this day don't think they realize how lucky they are and were with some of the staff they had there but one of my uh, one of my good friends who's also a great teacher Phil he used to say I don't need a Chromebook to successfully teach math and neither do the students and I agree I think that technology is great, particularly when I got into finance, it helped immeasurably. In fact, I wouldn't have been able to teach the class the same way without it. Now, I think your question, what you're really asking is regards to cell phones. Is that correct? Yeah, I was kind of curious about both because I know that both were a hassle, like sanctioned things like iPads were a nightmare for me because <laughs> they mandated that we use them. But kids were literally in Google Docs writing each other messages <laughs> while mm -hmm. I was teaching. They were FaceTiming their friends. And then that was with like like sanctioned school technology, but then with cell phones, that's like in its own galaxy. So I was curious what your experience oh, yeah. was with those. We, um, well, a, a humorous story. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many of, of your listeners or you, if you're familiar with a piece of software called Go Guardian. No. Mm, it's wonderful. It's it's genius. <laughs> I, I loved it. They installed Go Guardian on our uh, district computers and Chromebooks. Uh, it, this only works. <clears throat> excuse me, this only works on district equipment. So I could not do the following uh, if they were on a cell phone, but if they were on a district laptop or Google Chrome, uh, Chromebook, the software allows me as a teacher to look at what they are doing. I can see every, I can see their screen. I can see what they're doing. Uh, it was marvelous. I, I had so many good jokes with students. I would give out Chromebooks in my finance class and we would be looking at uh, usually typically something in the stock market. And so I'd be up at the front talking and I would have GoGuardian open in my computer, in my laptop, and I'd have the class there and I would be looking at them on their Chromebooks and they didn't know I could see what they were doing. <laughs> And so, so and so, you know, hey, Rogelio, you know, how's that, uh, how's that YouTube video working out for you? <laughs> and then, you know, the, the Chromebook would slowly close. <laughs> it's marvelous technology. Oh, uh, kind of mean, kind of mean. But, and then I would write messages to them. Hey, Amy, why don't you join us? I'm up here. And it would show up like an instant message. Oh my goodness, that was fun. Now, cell phones. Oh boy. <laughs> I used to tell my students, you know, guys, I love my cell phone just like you love your cell phone. I use my cell phone. I love texting. I love looking at Facebook on my cell phone. But cell phones are the bane of my existence in the 21st century in a classroom. I tried to work ways into uh, the curriculum in finance. Uh, they were able to use their phones. I sanctioned that if they wanted to look up, um, and like if they were looking at their stock investments. They liked that. And I also used a platform called Quizzes that is was marvelous. I love quizzes. A little formative assessment. I would create the questions. I could see what they were doing, get immediate feedback. And they liked it because they were able to use their phones to answer the questions. Uh, but the problem was, of course, that as soon as you put a, a cell phone out there, it, it, it it's, it's the wild west yeah it's the wild west and it became an ever increasing frustration to me mm -hmm. starting i didn't even get a cell phone until 2004 and back then of course you know it was a little motorola flip phone that has <laughs> come full circle now it's back in vogue but i uh i didn't get one to 2004 and they had them before that but when smartphones came out mm, how do you compete with a student who is watching a movie and they they don't want to stop? And how do you compete with that? I don't care who you are. You're not going to be able to compete with that, no matter how interesting you might be. And then there are the the policies, the cell phone policies in the district. In our student handbook, it, it's, it was clearly sa stated that devices such as cell phones were, were not really permissible and that if we caught you with them an X number of times, we can confiscate them. But when smartphones came out, and particularly in the last say eight years the district policy they would tell us no no we we don't take uh, we don't take cell phones I'm like well it's in the handbook if it's in the handbook i'm going to take a cell phone well we're, we're worried because it's a liability issue for you i never really believed that i think it was a liability issue for them Definitely. i never i 
Yeah, I never, I never fell for that. Um, and it became a source of, of frustration. We really wanted a, um, we really wanted a district wide rock solid cell phone policy, but it never happened. And to be honest, I probably was part of the problem because I did integrate the use of cell phones into my my finance class and without them, it wouldn't have been as successful. So it's like, I don't know where that, where does that lie? <laughs> you know, where does that lie? But taking cell phones from a student, uh, it was just something that they didn't want us to do, even though it said in the rules that we could. Interesting. Hmm. So I'm kind of curious, did you see standards-based grading or reporting in your district? And how did that change students' performance, their motivation? What was that like for you? I'll just put it out there. That was one of the reasons that I quit. Okay. Uh, I did not, we were first informed that this thing called standards-based grading or standards-based reporting is what they called it in our district came out of nowhere in the spring of 2021. Everybody was happy the year was coming to an end. I mean, we, here we were in the middle of a pandemic. Some of our colleagues had been sick and we were just happy that we were all still here. And it was that spring that our department had mentioned, oh, we just got word today that moving forward, we're going to be working on uh, standards-based reporting. And I thought, I'm not familiar with this. What What is this system? So I did some research on my own and we all sat down one day and talked about it. And I was I was mortified. I was mortified. I, I could see the issues coming. Like, the iceberg out there waiting for the Titanic. And all I could think of for my for my sake was, can I get out of this before it's fully implemented? Because I do not believe in this system. I don't believe in the system. When we, when we discussed it, most of us came to the same conclusion. And that was that it was meant to pass and graduate students who normally would not have. And I still yes. believe that. I'm sorry, it's a hill I choose to die on. You know, a one to four grading system, four is above, you know, three and four, of course, are passing, two is approaches. No. Mm -mm. And it was already becoming too easy. Everything it seemed like was, it was just, it, students were really, they weren't really required to do much. You know, as I, as we were moving forward, it, it there was so much pushback from every side that it's like, everything just seemed to get easier and easier. And I could feel it even creeping into my stuff. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. And then suddenly the standards-based reporting drops. What is it? What is it you said once? time that I just laughed out loud. The cosmic fly swatter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, this is a cosmic fly swatter and I don't, I don't want to deal with this. However, just the other day, um, President's Day was Monday and I get together with a group of my former colleagues and we all talk. And so I, I'm able to ask them how it's going. And they tell me that exactly what most people saw coming. Students who are going to be given a 50% on an assignment, no matter what, what's their motivation? Right. Well, I'm just, I, I can just pass it anyway. I'll just get a, I'll take my 50 and, and then I'll, I'll turn in maybe one or two extra assignments. And, and there used to be a joke, D is for diploma. <laughs> mm -hmm. I heard that in a, at the, from the counselors and uh, uh I just could not believe it. I, and, and they told us, it's like, we feel like our hands are tied. Mm -hmm. When we want students to do something, they, they no longer have, there's no skin in the game, as one put it. Yeah. There's no skin in the game. What, what are they going to do? Well, I don't have to do this because all I have to do is have X number of assignments. And they did tell me students were able to figure that out like lightning. Wow. Exactly what the bare minimum they had to do was in order to pass. They figured that out very quickly. For sure. And I don't know about you, but I used to feel like the administrators basically said <laughs> the student scores were a direct reflection of the teacher. So I feel like that puts a lot of pressure on the teachers to have to kind of fudge and inflate grades because we're yeah. being judged with the student score. Did you ever feel like that at all? Yeah, great inflation became a, 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 ser a pretty serious issue. And I could see it going on. A lot of us could see it going on. And <clears throat> you would see students that were getting, like, <clears throat> in our lower classes, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, lower classes, I mean, uh, like algebra one and geometry classes, and there would be particularly in algebra one, you'd have students getting A's everywhere. And yet when they would take state based assessments, they were scoring like in the seventh percentile or something. And of course, the district, you know, the up the ivory tower noticed that and they should have it was a problem. You know, that's legit on their part. Like what's going on here There's a disconnect. And we have all of these stunning grades that look so great. But then when it comes time for the assessments, state-based assessments, you know, the high stakes stuff. Uh, there's a big, big disconnect here. There's a big, big disconnect here. And there was. Mm. <laughs> 
did you find frustrating over the years in terms of just policies, procedures, things coming from the more administrative side of things? Was there anything that stuck out that just really started to drain your energy? Yes, um, there were, <laughs> there was too much uh, micromanaging. There was some micromanagement that, that went on, although I, I have to say that the administrators that I dealt with in the last 12 years, I have to, I have to give it to them. They, when a new administrator would come in, of course, they don't, they don't know what's going on in a, in a school. So they have to, they have to spend really most of the year kind of figuring it out, getting their, what is it that they say, the finger on the pulse. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of little informal observations and walkthroughs. And I found that, that what they did for me anyway, and I have a feeling anybody else who was competent is they say, oh, I see what this person's doing. They're doing a good job. I'll leave them alone. Now, policy wise, not so much. I would have to say uh, I do I, two things. One is that there was a never ending increase in the amount of stuff we had to do. And I've heard many teachers complain about the uh, the work life balance. And that was around the time it was after actually I had my surgery that I put it into full effect. I never took anything home after that. Like I'm ka-ching, clocked out at four o'clock. I'm not taking anything home. I'm not taking the stress home with me. I'm already worn out from an arm that doesn't work right during the day and I'm not going to do it. Um, so micromanaging, I think it did happen to some people, not to me. Uh, I will say one thing though. Oh my goodness. This came up in the, our little coffee clutch the other day. Worthless professional development. Yeah. I became flat out bitter about PDs, professional mm -hmm. development sessions, because 99 plus percent of the time they were, they, were, they were just worthless. And one of my colleagues framed it very well the other day when he said, you know, yeah, they're, they're still the PD that we do and it's useless and it's 90 minutes of fill time when we could all be doing something better. And he made a comment that was interesting to me and it, it, it sums it up great just great. And that is that he would not mind going to PD if it was had to do with instruction, mm -hmm. how to, imp how to improve instruction. Those don't really happen that much. If, when I look back on them, there were a few, uh, and some of them you could take away a little bit, but most of the time when we would all get together, it would be about policies and procedures and this paperwork and that paperwork. And like this, you know, the old, the old joke about this could have been an email. Yeah. So many meetings. Oh my goodness. So much wasted time. Yeah. PD is one of those things I would never have objected. I never objected to pro, uh, professional development that was, that was worthwhile, that was useful to me, that was informative to me or would help me with instruction. Mm -hmm. But I, I have a really rough time. I can think of one that was taught by one of the assistant superintendents. that was great on uh, Ruby Payne, Ruby Payne's uh, theories. I don't and know who's <laughs> Oh, she wrote a great book. Um, uh, she has a, a, a great book about why students won't perform. And it has to do with them not having their basic life needs met. It's a pyramid. And at the bottom is, do I have shelter and food? Do I have um, support from family members and parents? And as you go up towards the top, school is at the top. And if the, the lower levels of the pyramid are, are not there, there's really not much you can do. It was fascinating. It was really, really fascinating. It gave no, um, no help, it, no direct classroom help. Hey, do this to improve it. It was more of a diagnosis, which I guess we already knew, but it was still interesting to me. But I, right off hand, I'm, I'm hard pressed to come up with a single PD in the last five to eight years. I was a teacher that I came away with saying, wow, that was great. Mm -mm. <laughs> I hear ya. So I'm kind of curious, what did you see in terms of parenting? Because actually I just did a video on that yesterday. There's kind of a gentle parenting craze. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, did you see that at all in your time? I did. Classroom. I did. And I, I did watch your video, by the way. It was great. Um, there was it, it, the whole idea between of authoritarian parenting, authoritative, and then the gentle parenting or what they, I think they called it passive Perfect. parenting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Permissive. And they, they likened it to, um, they used examples from the Harry Potter films. Authoritarian parenting is Lucius and Draco Malfoy. Permissive parenting are the Dursleys with that horrible, obnoxious son of theirs. And then authoritative parenting are the Weasleys with love, compassion, but there are rules, the consequences. It was great. Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking about that this morning when I when I saw your uh, when I saw your video. Now, parents, uh, yeah, I the last the last twelve years I was a teacher. I taught a financial literacy class that I was very lucky to have had the opportunity to write my own curriculum for. It, the The school need, knew they needed some additional math classes for seniors, <clears throat> and the class was created. I'm glad they made that choice. It apparently wasn't. Um, very successful the first couple of years, but the one, the principal asked me, "Look, can you can you get in there and and do this? You know, we know you're creative. You got free reign as long as you are aligned with the national standards. Then you're good." And I was lucky enough to do it. So I sat down and asked myself, when I graduated from high school, what do I wish I uh, would have known 
that my parents didn't teach me. And so I used that question to come up with the curriculum and align it. And it was great. I loved it. I loved that class. The students liked the class. The students liked the class and who really liked the class were the parents. I bet. 12 years, never an issue, not one issue. Now, before that, when I taught geometry, algebra two, algebra one, the more, you know, mathy type classes that are, I mean, I hate to say this as a, as a math person. I love my subject. I love pure mathematics and you know, they're not very useful. Mm -hmm. No, not in real life. And I, you know, hopefully people won't throw rocks at me if they see see me out on the street, uh, the other math teachers. Uh, I did have a f not many run-ins. I was always pretty lucky. And I think it was probably because I handled as much as I could in terms of discipline. I handled it on my, my own. I always thought, this is my classroom. I need to handle this. I'm only going to get admin involved if it's something really bad or somebody has just really, really... Um, they're grinding my gears. So it, it was very rare that I would actually refer students to admin. The, the type of parents that I saw that were sort of combative, they were more interested in kind of blaming me than they were in saying, hey, okay, we realize, you know, there's a problem. The problem's been brought up. Um, what can we do together to work through this? I mean, I would have been open to that. But I can think of, um, I think I can think of two early in that this would have been 95, 96. My administrators, they they kind of took me under their wing. They knew that I was just a kid. You know, I was in my, my late 20s and I'd never had to deal with an irate parent. They actually came with me to this meeting. And the guy, of course, you know, he was a big wig in the community and his, you know, poopsie, his precious little daughter, you know, little shrinking Violet. She was just, she never did anything in class. And they just like ripped into me. And I'm glad my admin team was there because I, I wouldn't have known what to say. Uh, then there was the, f the woman who, when I was teaching an honors geometry class, came in on parent-teacher conference night. And her daughter, who was similar, just very passive-aggressive, you know, she never had a discipline problem, and she also did nothing. And this lady came in and proceeded to tell me in front of about eight other parents who were there that I was the reason that her daughter was not going to get into college. I personally, wow. I was gobsmacked. I, I had no idea what to say. And to my astonishment, the other parents turned on her Wow! and drove her out of the room. And they came back in and said, uh, do not listen. You're fine. My kid is in that class too. And we love it. Oh, that's so, great. <laughs> I know. I was like, wow, thank you so much. That could have been a really quick mutiny. I'm glad that they had your back. It's awesome. Yes. It was astonishing. They turned on her and said, maybe that's your experience, but my kid loves this class and there's the door. Don't let it hit your butt on the way out. <laughs> and then there was the other lady the, the when we were just, we were talking before the, before the recording started. <laughs> I, I taught uh, Cambridge classes in the IGSI program Oh, for maybe two years. It was not a good match. It was a bad match. I, I was not good at it. I was not good at it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't, I didn't like classes that had these massive, super high stakes tests at the end. I just, it, it made it difficult to teach and it made, it took a lot of the fun out of it. And I, there was a, a girl in parent teacher conferences and this girl had not been performing well and she was working, but she just, she shouldn't have been in the program. You know, the poor thing she was, she was in, she was drowning. She was in over her head and this mother sat across from me i can still see her face and she just went around in a circle trying to blame me for this for the daughter's failure or low or not failure she wasn't failing but she was like a d or c student but it had to be my fault somehow and i could see the thought process going on on her face while she was trying to come up with new reasons let's see i took that exit and it didn't work so i'm gonna try this exit I could see what she was doing. It's actually funny in retrospect, but I, I'm very fortunate. I, I've seldom had to deal with, I never had any really, truly horrible parents, any wow. truly horrible parents. So I'm I'm lucky that way. Just, just as I was really pretty lucky with administrators. I may not have liked the policies that were being implemented, but a lot of times policies, they come, they trickle down from the ivory tower. They don't come directly from principals. True. Yeah, and I, I'm very lucky. My principals were always always good with me. So I, I may be a little bit of an outlier there. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've had good students, good parents, good admin. So would you say overall that teaching has been joyful and fulfilling? What's your kind of overall feeling about your time as a teacher? Okay. Uh, well, I'll say this. Um, I do want to share one thing with you. Uh, it was another issue that kind of drove me out. But I have to say... I, I run into former students all the time, going back years. I just ran into one uh, last week at, this, at our grocery store. And I saw him and I thought, oh, there he is. Or something else will say. And I thought, well, he probably doesn't remember me. Well, yeah, I did. He saw me. Hey, Mr. Peters. And he, the, I, we interact and he found out he didn't know I was retired. And he's married and has a little girl and he's happy and he's doing well. Um, the um, So that sort of thing. When people ask me, uh, I run into either former colleagues, whether they were teachers or you know office staff. And sometimes parents, they'll ask 
asked me, do you miss teaching? Yeah, I do miss teaching. I really do. The, when it works, when teaching works, there's no better feeling. It's the most rewarding, fulfilling job when it works. When the, the stars align <laughs> and the cosmic fly swatter doesn't come down. I do miss that part. Uh, what I don't miss is all the, the rest of the rubbish that goes along with it. I will say this too, I wanted to share this with you because it wasn't all you know unicorns and butterflies. Going back to, this was finance time, so this would have been 2015 or so. Um, I note, began to notice the class of 2015 and, and anybody who, if anyone that I know watches this video, they will burst into hysterics when they hear me say the class of 2015 because I flat out did not like the class of 2015. They were the meanest people I I'd ever met. Extremely mean, cruel. I, I I feel badly for them. I would go back and forth between really intensely disliking them because they made my life so hard and feeling kind of sorry for them. Like, what? Why are you this way? You're so angry and bitter and you're, you're how old? 17, 18? Well, moving forward from that year, I began to notice that after lunch, we in our district, we had, we had different schedules over the years, but the last 10 years or so we had, we'd have lunch and then there was fifth period, sixth period and seventh period. Now, seventh hour was always my astronomy class, which was always a blast. I loved that class. Loved the kids. They loved it. It was great. Fifth hour would come in and fifth hour was always fine. We have right after lunch, which is a notoriously dodgy time to have a math class or any class sure. <laughs> after lunch all those carbohydrates hit in the bloodstream and then half an hour in crashing and everybody's sort of slumping so it was not fifth hour it was not seventh hour it was my sixth hour class and i noticed the very large number of students who not only were apathetic but they were they were very they were angry confrontational incredibly rude um crude and after a few years, I thought, what is going on? So I finally, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, that I only found this, I discovered this about three years ago. I talked to the counselor, I said, what is it with the sixth hour hell class? That one class takes 80% of my energy for the day. They're so horrible to try to get them to do anything, to focus, just to sit in the seats that they're supposed to sit in so they don't talk and stay off their phones. It was horrible. And then I discovered that they, um, the counselor said, oh, well, that class, oh, yeah, um, our alternative high school on campus has two shifts, a morning shift and an afternoon shift. And they're staggered slightly so that students who are coming out of the alternative school don't really intermingle with those in the regular population, so to speak. They said the reason that you're getting all those kids and they're like that is that they just came off the morning shift and someone up here, you know, in the rough hard air decided, oh, you know, it would be good if they could be with their friends for the last part of the day. And they were get all getting shoved in that one period all wow. those years. It was, it was exhausting. Now I've, I have good friendships with some of them over the years. Uh, I just ran into one the other day. He's doing great. But when you have them all together, it's, it was so tiring. It was so exhausting. It was demoralizing. You know, I, I I just wanted to help. And even though they admitted, oh, we, you know, we like the class, they still wouldn't do it. Yeah. And so it ended up me doing a lot of the leading, the hand holding, and I got them through it, but it, it was a really heavy price to pay. So it wasn't always, it wasn't always unicorns and butterflies. And uh, that, that, that was rough. That was really rough. And I think all teachers have that class. <laughs> you know, oh, my third hour. Oh my gosh, what is it with third hours? For me, it was always sixth hour. So that is so interesting. So I'm kind of, because I'm trying to, in my mind, put together the formula of a happy teaching career. So it sounds like generally you had a good population of students, good sets of parents. It sounds like you got to teach some classes that were awesome, like astronomy and, you know, financial literacy. And so I wonder, um, I know you said that kind of in the beginning, it was harder teaching like the, some of the geometry and some of the algebra. So I wonder if you would have had the same kind of like alternative school population plus sticking with, you know, algebra, geometry for your whole entire career. I wonder if it would have been a radically different experience. I, I think I can uh, say that, get, say an unqualified yes. Okay. And I also, if that had been the case, uh, I wouldn't have made it 27 years. That makes sense. It would, it would simply be too difficult. And I, I still will see, oh my goodness, I'll still hear people, <sighs> thank goodness, not too many. And consequently, they end up leaving the discussion still alive. <laughs> <laughs> you know that you'll hear people say, well, I don't know, teach all the teachers do is complain. If they don't like it, they should get out and do something else. Well, it's not quite that simple. True. Mm -hmm. It's not quite that simple. And, you know, and then to hear aspersive things like, well, it, it's just like glorified babysitting. I heard that a few times. And oh boy, my face would turn purple and my kids could see. There's a, a vein that runs up the middle of my forehead here. 
and my kids could always tell I was about to blow when the vein would appear. And it was, it was a joke. I mean, we used to joke a lot. I'm, I'm very fortunate that way that my kids and I 99% of the time got along, even with the sixth hour crew, wow. they weren't cooperative and they still made my life very difficult, but we all kind of, try, there was a middle ground. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I hear things like that, I just, I want to grab, you know, a pitchfork and a torch like in the old Frankenstein movies. <laughs> and like, you think it's easy. I, I remember running into the, a fellow years ago, early 2000s, and he, he was a local businessman, kind of a blowhard. And, you know, oh, it's not that tough. And teachers get summers off. Gee, I've never heard that one before of you. <laughs> all the time. All the time. <laughs> no, I never heard that one before. Yeah, keep going, buddy. And, you know, oh, it's not that hard. And how hard can it be to, you know, sit in front of a class? And I always got the feeling that they, that they thought we were sitting in our rooms with our feet up on the desk, reading the paper and drinking coffee mm -hmm. while, you know, pandemonium ensues around us. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I'd had enough of his nonsense. This is just after multiple run-ins with this guy. And I said, look, if you think my job is so easy, I, I welcome you. You can come in and you can do my job, not for a day, because I, my experience with students is if they have a, like a guest speaker or a teacher who's taking over for another person's classroom for a couple of days if they're sick, they actually kind of like the nude person. It's a change, it's something new. And then the honeymoon is over mm -hmm. and reality hits. You know, another thing people used to ask me was um, at the end of the first week of school in the fall, oh, so how's it going? And I'd say, I don't know. And they're like, what do you mean you don't know? I said, this whole week wasn't real. It's next week on Monday, they're going to wake up and realize, oh, I'm back <laughs> in school. It's nothing matters until starting with week two. Then you're going to see the real them. Mm -hmm. you know? But I digress. Yeah. And I, I told this fellow, you need to go into my room and teach, do what I do, not just teaching and being in front of the room or sitting there staring at them and telling them stories or something. You need to do it not for a day, not for a week, but for a month. Mm -hmm. And you have to do all of the rest of the rubbish that comes along with it, mm -hmm. including meetings that could have been an email, including professional development that you're kind of like, why am I here? You need to do it all, friend, not just being in the room and smiling in an avuncular manner. <laughs> I think too that getting the results part can be really, really hard, especially I think in this climate with all the standardized testing and the data and the mapping and the paperwork, you know, you can be like kind of a TED talker, <laughs> but getting that success replicated with students is an entirely different ballgame. Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, the way I used to explain it to people is it, it's a, it's like one of those carnival games that you, you take the little BB gun and you shoot at the moving targets, except not only are they moving, but they're in the dark. Mm -hmm. It's like, where do you, you know, you're, you're focusing on things that you, some, in some cases with regards to high stakes tests, you don't even, you don't even know, you have no idea what it even looks like. I'll, I'll use Arizona as an example. We had, um, for years, we took something called the AIMS test, A-I-M-S, and Arizona Intr Instrument for Measuring Standards, I think is what it stood for. <laughs> <laughs> not I'm not even sure now, you know, it's like PBIS. What does that stand for? Positive Behavioral Intervention, intervention Systems. Uh, there's too many acronyms. Um, then AIMS suddenly went away in early 2015. It was just wiped away. And the state announced that it was going to go to something that they would later call AZ Merit. So, of course, then comes, you know, the huge panic. Everybody at the district level freaks out. Oh my goodness, a new test. What are we going to do? And I remember being in PDs uh, discussing this and discussing it and discussing it and nothing would ever happen. And it finally, we, we reached the point, the teachers, where we had said, we don't, what are we doing in these PDs? We need to see if, if we're going to, to truly help out. You need to see sample items, not items taken directly from the test. Of course not. But things, I mean, t people who don't understand teaching don't realize that if a question, students will, will freak out if a question is worded differently than what they've seen. So what is the length? What does it sound like? What does it look like? And there were no, there were no sample items. And the state would say, oh, they're coming. Yeah, it's this and it's that. They finally released a few, but it was the same ones over and over. You know, I remember a, a one for math. It was a geometry problem. It had to do with, um, there was a, a, a little garden, like a flower garden, and there was a sidewalk around it. And then the next PD session we would go to, it was the same problem and the same problem and I is there one sample item for the entire test you don't know what you're aiming at it's just it's it's impossible yeah standardized testing was a complete nightmare did you guys have the benchmark test that you had to administer to students yourselves and like track data or did y'all not really do that in Arizona we did um let me see back I, gosh I've done this for so long uh there have been multiple benchmark tests the the one that was most disliked was something called are you familiar with galileo no <laughs> 
Okay. I know that it, it, many districts use Galileo, but it is a it's a predictor mm. for how well students will will do at that po- at that point on the Ames test. And so they actually asked us, they the the company, we complained, you know, a, a lot about these questions. They yes, they're going by standard, but these questions don't make any sense. How is this in the standard? The graphics were so primitive that like like a, a third grader could draw them. Like they're really bad. So they let us sit down and we got to choose the questions that would be on the on the test, on the benchmark test. Oh, we would okay. do the we would do those, I think I think it was three times a year. Twice in the fall and once in the spring, if I remember correctly. Uh and then the one before that, you'll probably know this one. Map. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now map. I got a little bit more out of MAP than I did out of Galileo. Mm-hmm. The Galileo results, everybody, you know, it's everybody seemed to think they were the greatest things since the ballpoint pen and sliced bread. I never really it gave me some feedback, yes, but I had I didn't have a lot of a lot of faith in the way the test itself was written. Mm-hmm. Now MAP was different. And I, I still don't think those tests are, are great, but at least MAP did give me an idea. It would show growth or if it, show, it would show if things were sort of, uh, had kind of plateaued for a student with regards to knowledge. And you could see it in graphical form and it, it was okay. I didn't mind that. I didn't mind that, but it, it was always a, somebody referred to it once as a benchmark blitz. <laughs> Where, you know, everybody would suddenly there'd be this big panic and, oh, make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're taking practice tests and make sure they sound like it. And like, can't we just teach? <laughs> can't we just teach? And that goes back to what my colleague had mentioned about PD. If it had been about instruction, that would have been great. But these PDs were never about instruction. It was always about the, what was driving them. Mm-hmm. You know, the, what we're looking forward to the test. But it's like nothing to deal with instruction. It's just practice, 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 make it look and sound the same. It's not the same thing. So your um, last 12 years, when you taught the finance class, was that the only class that you taught? And you taught like multiple sections of it? Or how did that work? Yes. Um, because I wrote the class, I'll, I have to admit, I was extremely protective of that class because it was a success. And it, it, at the risk of sounding a little arrogant, it worked. Yeah. It was a success. I, I had an, two administrators tell me that they're like the parents asked if they could come in and take the class. Yeah, I had two administrators tell me that. So I was very proud of that class, and it was my it was my little bailiwick, so to speak. So I, I was very no my class mine. So I in a way I set myself up for the overwork that was going to occur. Mm-hmm. The last few years the class ran. Um, I would typically have when the year started, which of course is when everybody's packed in there. I would have the last year I taught my, the largest class I had was 37. Wow. It was huge. And that was pretty typical. Mm -hmm. The, sometimes the morning classes would be smaller, but due to uh, vagaries in creating the schedule, which I frankly never quite understood, the counselors would try to explain it to me. It had something to do with when electives were offered. I, I ended up having some classes that were mammoth. The students were given an option if they wanted to take distance learning, if they wanted to complete their credits by distance. Now that actually decreased the numbers fairly significantly. You know, kids saw a way to be at home and not have to face teachers and be able to, you know, go online and Google answers. And you, know, if you, you can probably divine how I feel about that kind of learning. Oh yeah, not, that was terrible. <laughs> it's, it's not learning. It's, it's filling in a blank and it's making somebody happy somewhere. The second influx would occur right after Christmas Mm -hmm. because students who were taking a class that they didn't really want to do the work in, and then this would be like a pre-calc class. They just, they don't don't like math. So what they do is they would, they would tell the counselors, you know, oh, well, they they almost had a speech down that they would tell the counselors, well, I just feel like it would be more useful if I could take finance because, you know, this class isn't meeting my needs. And so I knew the beginning of January, I was going to open the door and there, I would be I'd be having five six additional kids in each class period wow. you know and that was it was hard and I I would immediately they'd come in and I'd say okay uh don't give me a song and dance I've been doing this for three decades just tell me the truth why are you here is it because you don't want to be in calc and sometimes they would go to start the little speech you know the prepared coached speech I'd be like no just tell me the truth yeah, yeah it's because I don't want to be in calc okay then we can work together but don't give me a song and dance yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. And so would you teach like six classes a day or what did that schedule look like? The last five or six years I was there, I actually, the, the enrollment in the class was so big that I had to sell my planning period. You know, I, I mean, it increased my income, thank goodness. And, you know, that'll help with, with not only with my, my pension, it helped a lot, but also with social security when I go to take that. Mm-hmm. It was exhausting, but I had to sell. I was teaching six classes a day, not five. The seventh hour class, my astronomy class, uh, I would never give that up. It was, we used to call it the dessert class. Oh. So that meant I had five sections of finance, three in the morning and two in the afternoon, one, two, three before lunch. 
and then five, six right after lunch. So I'm kind of curious, what, what did you do to keep yourself energized and in a happy, healthy place? Like, was that ever a struggle? Did you ever, you know, deal with burnout? What kind of kept you going through all of those years? Yeah, it's interesting you, that you, that you ask this. I, I was recently uh, talking to my mother who lives nearby, 30 miles north of here. And she, we were talking about school and, you know, how hard the last couple of years were with my, with my arm and just becoming, getting more and more tired. And she told me, she said, well, I first began to notice a change in you around 2010, which coincides to what we talked about earlier, how I was noticing that things weren't working anymore. Like the motivation in kids was gone. It would have corresponded to that time. And the first 15 years of teaching, my mom said, you know, you were, oh, you were just, you were all on top of it. And you, you know, I knew you would take work home and you'd have all this project work you were doing developing. And she says, and then around 2010, I began to notice that you weren't quite as enthusiastic about it. Now, I wasn't aware of it then. It kind of surprised me. She, she blindsided me with that. So it was apparently visible to other people, but not to me. Mine came the last three, three to five years. Um, what would I do to keep myself up? Well, I always had my, my astronomy class to look forward to. And once I started teaching finance, that gave me a huge boost, especially the first few years because it was such a success. So I, I, I guess that means there's probably a little bit of ego in there too. <laughs> we're, we're humans after all. Uh, but then when the cell phone problems began to get worse and worse and the sixth hour issues started becoming worse and worse, uh, it, it, the, the decline was pretty rapid, mm -hmm. you know, and then the, my surgery in 2018, that, that was a, a game changer and I could just feel it coming. Was I burned out? No. Was I close? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was, I could see some changes in myself that were, I could directly, directly attribute to my fatigue. Mm -hmm. I noticed that in uh, the finance class and even in astronomy, sometimes we wouldn't cover as much material as we had before. And I would, I would honestly look at it and say, is it because we spent too long on another unit or what, what was the deal? What's going on? And the answer was no. It was the fact that I was just kind of beginning to slide off. Mm -hmm. And I would begin to notice in, in the math classes I taught, you start cutting corners as a teacher. And when you start cutting corners like that, making things, giving in, making things a little bit easier because it's easier on you, that's a bad sign. And I could mm -hmm. see it, I could see it there and I could see it coming. So I think I got out just in time. I got out before the standards-based reporting. And before I truly, I did not want to be that teacher that I had seen. Because we, we all know teachers like that. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to be a joke and I didn't want to be, you know, this horrible horrible, bitter person. Definitely. Well, it sounds like you have had a rarity these days. You've had a successful, fulfilling career. You've built really positive relationships with students. You've left a legacy with your financial class. Like that is awesome. I rarely get to hear happy teacher stories, but I would say this is one of the happiest teacher stories I've ever had on teacher therapy. And so that's good though. <laughs> well, I uh, I was actually best man for one of my students. Aww. Yeah, That's Danny. Awesome. His name's Danny, and he graduated in 98 or 99, and he's in his early 40s now. And in 2007, I think it was, he got married, and I was his best man. That's beautiful. Yeah. Now, I, I, I'll share this with you, too. These these stories do happen. You'll, I, I think you'll like this as it is positive. In my third hour class in 2000, it was either 1920 or 2021. There were these three guys that sat in the front of the room. And right now, I cannot think of their names, and I wouldn't give them anyway. Well, they were just sort of like this little thug squad. You know, they, weren't, they were harmless. But they didn't want to do anything. Nothing I could do would make them work. I tried for the first semester, and then I realized I can't, you can't make them do something if they're not going to do it. And I don't, I'm not fluent in Spanish, but I, I'm pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I would try to get these guys to work. The first thing they do is they'd walk in the door, they'd all sit down, boom, 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 the phones would come out. And then it was like, no, you can't make me put my phone away. You know, who are you? Shut up, stupid teacher. So after a while, I was like, okay, I'm just going to kind of, like Mr. Peterson says, you focus the 80% on the 20. And we were in a unit on how to fill out um, hiring forms, W-4, tax withholding forms, in a, a larger unit on jobs and hiring, how to interview, all, all that all that fun stuff. And so then it was time, I was done with direct instruction, and then it was time to, to do some guided practice and then independent practice. And I made up a whole lot of fake people, their situations, their ages, their addresses, and they had to fill the paperwork out, and they had to fill out the withholding forms the right way. That was fun. I, I love doing stuff like that. It's creative. It's fun. You know, you can't really learn that stuff in a book, not if you're in high school. So um, they, he got the assignment and he, he looks at it, you know, he, he takes the, the, uh, the paper and he looks at it and he looks at the guy next to him and he says, Como se hace? how do you do this? And I remember just feeling like I died inside. Mm. 
what was I doing all this time? You know, you're on your phone. You're not paying attention. It's just, just a waste of my time. It was depressing. Well, last fall, I opened Facebook one morning and there was a message request in there and it was him. Aww. And he said, you know, hey, do you remember me? I said, yes, I do. And I said, I'm going to have to tell you right away. You're not my favorite person. That's why kids would tell me, you know, I was savage because I would just, I would ask him, is it savage or mean or is it just the truth? Mm -hmm. Well, just the truth. Okay, then are we all right? And he said, yeah, I know I wasn't because I was horrible to you. Yeah. And he said, now I'm out there on my own. And he described the, the couple of jobs he'd had and how he'd had, um, he'd been taken advantage of a couple of times. But he says, I just wanted to say, I'm sorry. Wow. He said, everything you said was going on out there, it is. Mm -hmm. And he said, I just wish I had paid more attention. Mm -hmm. I did learn from your class. You probably don't think I did, but I did. And I want to thank you. And I also just want to say, I'm sorry. Wow. That's like it a was, teacher dream. <laughs> it, was, it was astounding. And then we started talking, you know, we talked for half an hour wow. and he's like, look, I got to go, but I just wanted to let you know. I said, I felt bad. I remember that day that I said that to you in class. I'll say, I say, I remember that. And I said, I didn't realize how, how hard it was for you to hear that. Mm -hmm. And he says, I just wanted to let you know that I did learn and that I'm sorry that I didn't pay more attention because I would have learned more and maybe I wouldn't have gotten taken advantage of. Wow. Yeah. That, those are, that's one of those things that, yeah, teachers, teachers live for stuff like that. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, I think I will ask you one more question. And that is, what advice would you have? Actually, I'll give you two scenarios. One for somebody that's thinking about going into education. What kind of advice would you have for them about what it takes to be successful? And another fun question I like to ask is if you had a magic wand and you can change one thing in education, what would you change? Oh boy. I knew you were going to ask the second one. I wasn't sure about the first one. Uh, and you know, earlier I was actually thinking, what could I say for the second one? Maybe it's better to address that one first. The system's really a mess. It's really a mess. And as maybe fatalistic or nihilistic as this might sound, um, I think that it's going to have to kind of be rebuilt. For sure. It's had way too many band-aids put over it. Um, what do they call them in Microsoft? Um, um, when uh, Windows updates, they call them patches. And it's really not fixing the problem. It's just putting a patch over it so nothing is leaking out. Yeah. And I feel like there's so many Band-Aids on the system right now that peeling them all away, I wonder what's even underneath anymore. Sure. I know that's that's not positive. I know that's not a, maybe not what you wanted to hear. But I think, I do believe, I think things need to change. I do think that students do need a sort of liberal, liberal arts kind of education from high school. But I also feel that it's totally appropriate to give them options other than college. Mm -hmm. That was driven down our students' throats. And it was one of the things that my seniors, I taught seniors, that was a senior level class. We would have these days, I, they would come in and I could tell they were in a bad mood. I don't know what happened, but something, you know, they'd walk in and the room would get darker and I could tell, I'd say, okay, we're off script now. I close the door and I'd say, talk to me. Nothing that you say will leave this room, of course, unless it's something I have to report. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's about the school, other teachers, what? It, tell me. And their worry was that simply that they're not going to be able to be a success. Am I going to be able to find a job that I can support myself or my girlfriend or my, my wife and my children? How, we see how bad it is. And they're right. It is tough. And those those moments, those are like heartbreaking moments. But they would, they would tell me these things. This is what we're worried about. This is what you see. You know, I don't want to go to college because I have friends who went to college and now they're $100,000 in debt and they still can't get a job. And something's got to address. I mean, certificate programs will help. I have had a number of former students go through them in auto mechanics and HVAC, uh, electrical, and they're doing extremely well. There's something in Arizona called, I don't know if it extends beyond Arizona, but it's called uh, Job Corps. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's free. Mm -hmm. If you meet all the requirements, it's free. In fact, they even give you a little stipend. Mm -hmm. And all three of these fellows that I'm thinking of, the three specific ones, they went through it and they're, I mean, they're making a heck of a lot more money than I ever made. Wow. Yeah. So that's doesn't really sound like an answer to your question, but I, I guess maybe what I'm getting at is students, we need to focus more on giving students to something that's useful. And I think that's why the finance class was such a success. It was a little bit of an outlier. Mm -hmm. The nursing programs, some of the um, uh, career and technical, the CTE classes, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're useful. They, you get an actual skill out of them and not, not be so old fashioned. And I know once again, I'm hoping I'm, I don't get, you know, the cosmic fly swatter <laughs> doesn't come down on me and people start throwing rocks at me. What are you saying? You're a traitor. <laughs> now, what would I say to somebody just getting into the profession? I did have a former student uh, many years ago who wanted to, to get in, and I told him, don't. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think. I knew his personality, and I just knew that he would not, he would not work. It wouldn't work for him. 
he was sort of sensitive and that sensitivity is great in some ways but if you have issues with discipline and classroom management it, it'll they'll be out of the profession in a year two years mm-hmm. um now somebody who's already on that course and their mind is made up mm, understand that you're not going to you're not going to be anywhere near fully prepared for what you're going to walk into. Um, you're not going to f- be fully prepared with regards to student behavior. You're not going to be fully prepared with regards to interactions with parents. Again, I was lucky. I really didn't have too much trouble in that area, but a lot of teachers do. A lot of teachers do. A lot of people on your channel have. Oh yeah. Uh, a lot of people have, and I just count my lucky stars. I never did. Also, you're going to have to be ready for something that that I also consider myself naive for years is that I always thought this is a school. This is education. Paul Politics and education don't mix. And I don't mean politics as in Republicans and Democrats. I mean politics as in the scheming and the inner workings of a school. Mm -hmm. Well, they need to know it's going to be there. Definitely. It's going to be there. There are going to be people who will be promoted into positions that they have no business being in because they know somebody. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a shock when you see that. I, I was so naive for so many years. I didn't see it. And I can't believe that I was that way. I, I It's astounding to me. But I think they need to be aware of those things. And they also need to be aware. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to channel my Mr. Peterson on this. They cannot lose sight of the fact that they have a life outside of school. Mm-hmm. Learn to say no. Uh, when you leave at the end of the day, the phone is off. Any message that comes through from school will be ignored until the following morning. Mm -hmm. And we always want to help. And I think sometimes teachers are taken advantage of that way. Yeah. It's for the kids. Well, yeah, it is. And But you need to let me decide on whether I'm going to say yes or no. And usually the older I got, the longer I was in it, the more I said, no, I'm sorry. This is not my, this isn't, it's not my monkey's not my zoo. No, <laughs> I'm not going to be back taking tickets at night. I'm not going to be there on Saturday to do this, that, and the other. No, you had me from 7.30 until 3.30 or 4 o'clock and, and that's up. So learn to say no, learn to get that good work-life balance or, or you won't make it. Absolutely. It's, Every minute, every minute we move forward in this Band-Aid fixed system, there's going to be more and more stuff for teachers to do. Well, I appreciate this interview so much, Chris. I have learned a lot. And yeah, for my audience, thank you so much for watching. If you want to interview with me, you can email me at teachertherapytrish at gmail.com. And if you have any show ideas, let me know in the comment section and I'll see what I can do. And thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you guys next time. Bye for now, everyone. Thank you.